Good day, everybody, and welcome to our presentation. Today, we're going to talk about a couple of aspects that are foundational in relation to performance evaluations. We want to talk about the types of meetings that we should have during the evaluation process. We then want to talk about how best we collect information in order to produce our evaluations. Finally, we'll talk about some rating errors to avoid in order to create an unbiased and fair evaluation. We've talked about evaluations quite extensively already, and we've talked about how evaluations should be more frequent, quarterly probably at the most. Some do monthly, but if you do a evaluation monthly, it's probably going to be a fairly compact system and process to follow. In other words, the information is pretty easy to connect and collect because it's in a very more it's a much more frequent basis. And then also the way it's delivered again is a very uh, succinct uh, manner in which we do it. It's usually less than a page, even an email. But for maybe a more formal, as the slide indicates, a formal process for evaluations, quarterly seems to work out quite well. If an employee is doing well, you give positive feedback on a more frequent basis. If an employee is not doing as well or needs some assistance, there isn't a tremendous amount of time that can go by between evaluations where performance is left uncorrected. In other words, we can correct performance much quicker. So quarterly tends to work out well. And so let's talk about the process that we're going to use on a more formal basis. There's a number of meetings that you have some systems will have will indicate you can have upwards of six meetings. I don't believe that you need to, especially since evaluations are intended to be more frequent, more conversational. And as a result of that, we should have meetings that are in a more timely basis, no more than a half hour, but also that follow a certain format. The evaluation is presented, uh, the evaluation is discussed, and then there's a final evaluation that is given after the meeting occurs. So that's not too many meetings, but we're going to go over some meetings that are combined, but at least some formats that you should go through if you have a meeting with an employee. System inauguration really isn't a meeting. That's usually when you just send out a, a note saying you're in the evaluation period. In fact, if you're a teacher for a course, they usually tell you before the course starts, we're going to evaluate you during this course. We usually start after the announcement that the evaluation period begins with some type of self-appraisal. I'm a tremendous fan of a self-appraisal. We should know that some of the late, latest statistics are about 90% of employees feel that they perform better than their supervisors indicate they do. Kind of interesting. Probably not foreign to believe that. Most people maybe have a higher impression of themselves and other people would have of them. Um, we could say that about ourselves as well too. So when you go into a meeting knowing that your employee feels or may feel if the trend uh, continues with them that the way that they would judge their performance is probably better than you would judge their performance. It means, given that thought, that we're going to have to be able to detail more specific formats and, and processes exactly how you would rate and assess an employee's performance. It also means that we need to give a number of examples. Um, using an example of that example, if, if you indicate that an employee is not necessarily timely with the work that they do, if they were to argue that they are, you would have to have two or three or four or five or how many examples of where there was a due date that was missed either by hours or days or even weeks. So having the right information and having the detailed information is always an important aspect. But we start after the inauguration, after we state that the evaluation period is beginning, we start with the self-appraisal, and that's a document that an employee needs to fill out. Most employees don't enjoy doing a self-evaluation. I don't know why, actually. It gives them an opportunity to participate in the process, and it gives them an opportunity to relate to their employer some of the tasks and responsibilities and consequences that they feel are meritorious related to their performance, a self-appraisal. So you're informing the supervisor, hey, don't forget about these aspects that I completed when I was doing my work over this last quarter. 
It's a reminder, in fact, to the supervisor that these are the things that I did that were meritorious. I do think the self-appraisal, again, is a highly advantageous aspect of the process, especially for the supervisor. Why for the supervisor? If a supervisor has anywhere from 10 to 15 employees, which is standard, some years ago it used to be anywhere from 6 to 10, there, and a supervisor is having more employees now, it's hard to remember everything or every aspect of an employee's responsibilities. A self-appraisal reminds the supervisor of an employee's performance. So it can be highly advantageous. From an employee, it allows them to participate in the process. We've talked about that these performance evaluation systems are really intended to be a conversation about performance, about an employee's worth to an organization. We often don't use the word worth, but it's a good word to use in relation to evaluations. Employees have value in an organization. In other words, for value is worth. The greater worth you have for an for an organization, the more uh, consequences you should have in terms not only of pay but promotions as well. So value and worth are important. The performance evaluation system is intended to assess that value and worth of an organization. That's really fundamentally what what evaluations are about. So the self-evaluation, the self-appraisal, starts the conversation between the employer and the employee. That is again foundational to evaluations. It's a conversation. It's a conversation about the value of employees and also the value of the organization. We see here this classic performance review and that's where you actually complete the evaluation and in some ways you present it to the employee. Pretty simple, right? So you start by saying, I'm going to do an evaluation of you. I want you to participate in the evaluation, send me any information that I should consider as your supervisor when I complete, when I at least draft, the evaluation. And then I'm going to have a meeting with you to talk about how I view your performance. It's going to be in draft form. That's really critical. You send it in draft form. You say, this is going to be the basis for our conversation that we're going to have. And that allows the employee to review that performance evaluation tool, ideally before the meeting occurs, and then when they attend the meeting, then you have the supervisor and the employee who are going to converse about A, the self-appraisal, B, the appraisal by the employer, or the supervisor in this case, and then you're going to have some, we may say a meeting of the minds, but you're certainly going to hope to have some agreement on how performance should be reviewed. Our goal in evaluations is to make sure that employees clearly understand their role and clearly understand how they're performing that role. It is the goal. It's not, it's not supposed to be confrontatory. Hopefully it's not negative as well. The time that we have the evaluation, our hope is that employees clearly understand how they've been performing. As we mentioned though, most individuals feel that they do better, perform better, are better than how others would rate them. And so going into this review, we may have some surprises on behalf of the employee who didn't understand or believe that they performed, at least by the way the supervisor has interpreted it. But at the end of this performance review meeting, the hope is that there is some agreement on how the supervisor would assess somebody's performance and how the employee would assess their performance as well. That usually leads to a merit and salary review. Here's something interesting that we'll talk about in this presentation that really doesn't get talked about as much in relation to performance evaluations. And that is in relation to the merit and salary review, which is not on an annual basis. My proposal is that merits and salary reviews be done on a more frequent basis. It's hard to do it monthly because of all the changes that have to be completed on behalf of HR. However, it's getting easier because so much of it is computerized. Back in the day, some years ago, you used to have to do forms and get signatures in order to increase a person's pay. Now, most of that is done online. In fact, signatures are, are taken online. You get approved online. So to do a merit or salary review is much easier today than it was some years back. 
That means that you can give merits and salaries on a more frequent basis. Just like we don't want to have an annual performance review, we also don't want to have an annual salary review. It should be concurrent with the performance evaluations that we're doing. So if we're doing them on a quarterly basis, we really should have a salary increase on a quarterly basis. And that means, is to use a round number, is if you're getting an 8% increase a year, and I know that's quite high, but if you do a quarterly review, then you would get a quarterly salary of, of about 2% per quarter. Four quarters would be 8%. That would be a great um, increase in, in compensation, of course, and that's just used as an example to easily divide by four. Some would say it's very difficult to do that. I think it's actually more advantageous to do it that way. It more closely ties salary with performance. And it also closely ties how well a firm is doing with how much that they should pay out. As an example, um, the salary review may come at a time that the organization is not doing well in that particular point of the year. Therefore, the merits may not be as fruitful as an employee would expect. But if you can tie the organization's financial performance with salary reviews on a more frequent basis and merit reviews, then you may be able, when an organization is doing well at that time, do a fairly good merit. And then when they're not doing as well at other quarters, maybe uh, the amount of money isn't as rewarding. But it more closely ties amount of money given to an employee with how well the organization is doing at the time. It also tends to reward performance on a more frequent basis. Research tells us that employees' performance increases a month before their evaluation and a month after the evaluation. Outside of that time frame, which is somewhere around two to three months, employee performance tends to wane. Why is that? It's because they have something like eight or nine months before their next evaluation and salary review, but they are not as concerned at that point about their salary. However, if they know that they're going to be getting salary reviews on a more frequent basis, performance may not lag as much as it traditionally has shown, at least in terms of research. Great example to think about. So that is, and we'll talk more about that um, as we continue our conversations about evaluations, but that's what I look for in relation to a meeting. A, you announce that there's going to be an evaluation period. B, you do some kind of self-evaluation or self-appraisal by the uh, employee. And then you have this meeting where you have uh, the meeting of the minds, which is the employee's uh, perception of their performance and the supervisor's perception of the employee's performance. And you hope that there is some agreement. If there isn't, of course, um, and we'll talk about ratings in a few minutes. If there isn't, of course, the supervisor's um, view is going to be controlling. But in order to achieve the type of performance that we expect from the employee, we hope that they understand where the employee's performance is lacking, where the supervisor believes that it could be reinforced, and that there is some kind of agreement going forward that these are the areas to work upon. An area, as we back up a bit and talk about this performance review, an area that has a considerable discussion and evaluation is where does the information come from? I'm a big fan um, of including uh, employees in the process. I'm not as... Uh, and, and not as much of a proponent of including as many people as possible in the evaluation. That may sound counterintuitive. You may think that there's so many areas that we can get employee performance data from. We should use as many sources, as many channels as possible. I certainly don't disagree with that statement. That can be highly advantageous. But you have to be somewhat suspect of where you get much of your information and why. So let's look at where some of the sources of employee information could be and where supervisor information could be as we create this performance evaluation system. Of course, you can get information from supervisors, peers, direct reports from self, which is your uh, 
employee assessment of their own performance, customers, and then also any type of performance monitoring and big data. Let's talk about the last one first. Employee performance monitoring big data is a great source of information. And that tends to be what we call quantitative. And an example is, did the employee come to work on time? We can tell by when they came in the door, or they clocked in, or they turned on their computer. Fairly um, objective data. Big data could be how well an employee has done in terms of sales. That is numerical, again, quantitative, easy to collect, and then also easy, easy to utilize. And finally, easy to present. You're expected to increase your sales 5%, you only did it 4%. Very difficult um, to debate that that is the answer. You can debate why, but as far as quantitative, quantitative data, it tends to be more difficult um, for an employee to defend. Qualitative, which means how well you did it, uh, and a good example I often use is colors. So if you're intending to, uh, as part of your job to create a blue color, let's say you're an artist, and you submit this color to your supervisor, and they go, well, eh, it's blue, like the background here, but it's not the blue I was looking for. It's still blue, which is what's expected, but qualitatively, it's not the shade of blue that they like. That's the, how qualitative, which is a person's perception, tends to come into play. But employee performance monitoring and big data is a great source of information in order to include on the performance evaluation tool. We talked about self, which is uh, the fourth bullet there. I think it's a great source. Remember, though, that it's going to come in biased. Um, an employee is going to view themselves in a much higher uh, frame, a much uh, higher reference than others may. And that's natural in, in order, how, in order how, how people view themselves. Now we start getting into more subjective areas that we have to be a bit cautious about, including on our evaluations, direct reports. Uh, direct reports, so if you're a manager that's evaluating a supervisor, and that supervisor evaluates people, we have to be very careful about the information that we get from subordinates. If an employee um, is not doing well and their supervisor is quite directive in how um, they converse with their subordinates on how well or how not well they're doing, then that supervisor may not like uh, be liked by their subordinates. doesn't mean that they didn't do well in their job. In fact, they may do exceedingly well. But if they're quite constructive in how they manage their employees, and the employees don't like that oversight um, or feel that they're held to a standard that they shouldn't, the information that comes from how well that supervisor does may not be necessarily positive. For that reason, we have to be suspect, or at least we have to question the information we get from direct reports. It doesn't mean that it is not important or valuable and could not provide um, data that we should utilize in the evaluation, but we certainly need to take into account the context, and context is an important word here. Context also exists to peers. Peers are the people on the same level. So if you're a supervisor and there's four or five or six other supervisors, then those would be your peers. Information from your peers has to be at least questioned or even suspect. For instance, if you're a supervisor that is very hard charging, very ambitious, and works considerably more than your peers, then the information you may get from your peers may not be necessarily positive. They may even be jealous of you. Taking that information into account in an evaluation may not necessarily be fair, especially if your performance clearly exceeds your peers, and your peers are at least um, not kind in assessing your own performance because they feel it may place them in a bad light. So we talked about direct reports and also peers and some of that information should be suspect. The same may occur with customers. An example could be that customers may not have a positive impression of a person, but it may be less about the way you perform the job as opposed to what your organization is requiring you um, to 
do and act in relation to customers. For instance, if your customers are expecting uh, to return products and your organization has a new policy that doesn't allow the organization to accept return products, at least maybe in the manner in the past, then your customers may not uh, view your performance as meritorious, as advantageous. It has less to do with your job and more to do with company policy. There's an example where customers may not have a positive impression of you. Probably one of the more easy um, ways that customers can negatively impact performance is if you have a job where they have added considerably the number of clients or customers that you must serve. And a good example is if your waiter um, or, a, or a waitress at a restaurant and you used to have five tables and now you have 10 or 15 tables, then the service that you provide to those tables is certainly not going to be um, as, you're not going to spend as much time on each table because you have so many more tables. And if you were to be reviewed by customers, the review may not be as positive if you only had five tables. And so to take that information without the context may mean that your evaluation may not truly reflect your performance, but it, instead it reflects that you're overburdened in your role, and as a result, you're not able to provide the type of uh, performance that you would like. So when we talk about who should provide performance information. It sounds great that our peers and direct reports and our customers should provide input. We're not saying that they shouldn't, but you really have to take into account the context of the information that they provide because that information may not necessarily give an accurate or true perception or reflection of your performance. So that's what we look for in providing information. It's often called a 360 uh, evaluation, where you take information from everybody who references um, an employee's performance. In my view, and the view that we use when we do uh, consulting, is that if a supervisor is doing their job, they should have a clear and intimate understanding of a person's performance. They should have a comprehensive view of how well an employee performs. That is the job of a supervisor. The job of a supervisor is to obtain the greatest value of their subordinates. Supervisors do less work as far as the day-to-day -day work. Instead, they utilize their skills to maximize the performance of those that, that they supervise. That's where they spend a majority of their time. If an employee spends, or a supervisor spends uh, a considerable amount of their time doing actual work, rather than ensuring that those who work for them do their work, then you may not get the greatest value out of that component, that unit, that division. And so if a supervisor is doing their job well, they should have a keen understanding of an employee's performance, even without the input of the others, are when they do an evaluation, and for instance, they take into account cons uh, the customer perception of, uh, an employee's performance, they would have known that, yes, customers are not going to be happy with this employee, but that is because we have a new policy that says that um, our employees now have to wait on 15 tables instead of five. So we would expect that the level of attention that our employees are giving to employees would go down considerably, and customers may not be happy about that. So that gives you some insight on providing information in relation um, to employees. The last part we want to talk about is rating errors. And there's a number of rating errors that we see. Intentional errors and unintentional errors. Intentional errors can be aspects like rating inflation and rating deflation. Most likely the ratings uh, errors that we see the most today are rating inflation. It's the same as grade inflation. If we look um, throughout the educational um, years, we see that the grades have continued to rise, some say since the 1960s. That's been quite some time ago. But rating inflation is similar to grade inflation as well. There's reasons for it, of course, but we do see that the average ratings 
of employees has increased. That's one of the reasons why we moved from odd rating categories to even. So we want to delineate better, as we've talked about earlier. We want to delineate better an employee's performance by making uh, clear distinctions to uh, how well somebody has met the expectations of their position. The unintentional errors are due to the complexity of the task. That's what human resources is intended to do. They're supposed to, their charge is to create a system that reduces the complexity of tasks. We've talked already about some ways that that can be done. More frequent evaluations. Timeliness is important. That, in, that decreases errors and increases accuracy. Having a more simplistic tool, one page, no more than one page. More check boxes, less narrative forms. It's another form that reduces the unintentional errors. To overcome the rating inflation is very difficult, but there's some ways in which we can reduce some of these intentional errors of rating inflation. And some of the more important ways that we can do these to, to reduce what we would call um, rating inflation is, and there's some uh, philosophies or strategies where you can only have so many the best evaluations and so many the next best evaluations and so many the next next best. So in other words, you constrict an, a, a supervisor by giving so many high ratings. If you have 10 employees, you say something like only three can be superior, only the other three can be exceeds, three have to be meets, and then the rest have to fail. General Electric, a very large company, is quite famous by saying that the bottom 10% of their employees would be eliminated, would be uh, terminated. So they would rate everybody, and if you were towards the bottom, then they would, uh, you would have an opportunity to increase your performance. But they had a clear delineation on who wasn't performing if you've got low ratings. So uh, the rule was you really, gotta, you really have to work hard to get a high rating. And if you were towards the bottom, there was clear consequences. That's what we call a forced rating, um, where you only have so many in so many categories. I'm not a fan of forced rating. I think that if somebody's superior, they should be rated as superior or exceeds whatever the top rating would be. If everybody exceeds, then they should be rated exceeds. But there has to be a clear uh, and convincing reason why somebody is rated in a certain category, whether it's the highest category or the lowest category. And that falls to a couple of areas. Quite possibly, the best way to reduce rating inflation and deflation is to, be, is to have examples. And examples um, are, for the most part, um, undeniable. So we mentioned earlier about if you're coming to work on time and Many employees will say, I always come to work on time. And then if you can show that, well, here's data from the front door, and we can show that over the last 10 days, you came in late five days. And so having uh, examples is really important. And the second aspect that I want to highlight here is the issue of fairness. For those employees who may say, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm always here on time. Then you give them examples of where they weren't here on time. And that's irrefutable. It's, it's impossible to debate that they weren't here on time, using one example. The next argument you may hear is everybody's late. And this gets into the issue of fairness. So you have to offer examples, but then you have to have a keen awareness of fairness. And that means that when an employee says, but everybody else is late too, you can pull out a, a document and say, well, here's a document of the 30 employees that we have, it shows that of the 30 employees, only one was late 10 of the last 20 days, to use an example, and that was you. And in that situation, it's impossible, certainly difficult, for somebody to claim that your data is not correct. And then you get into the third aspect was the excuse. Well, I know I was late but here's the reason why. And so if you follow those three aspects, it really doesn't eliminate, but certainly controls rating inflation 
uh, to a point where you're able to give a more true reflection of a person's performance. With that, everybody, hope you enjoy the day. Certainly look forward to continuing the discussions in the coming days. Take care.